either you say you need to know the data, you need to do data quality on your data, you need to reshape your data, uh, you need to work on dispersion of your data, you need to define the best model, train it, whatever. That's a pure data science. Whatever it relates to BPM or not, it's not our job, honestly, I think. Um, or you try to guide a little bit the, the user or the developer to say, OK, we, we did the effort to think about how artificial intelligence could uh, match with uh, BPM. So we are trying to understand a little bit what is the generic data that we can know. Let's, we're going to prepare the model for you. Uh, of course, you are going to help us to tune it. But uh, we are going to uh, do uh, uh, the majority of the work and try to make it generic. So that was what we tried to do. Uh, so the first thing was, OK, our objective is let's try to do work on a predictive model that is generic enough so it applied to the majority of the process-based applications. And uh, then we need to choose one algorithm or several algorithms. Uh, and again, uh, we wanted to predict and recommend. So here's a really simplistic view of what are the algorithms out there when you need to pick up one. And uh, I wanted to classify them on uh, accuracy of the alg algorithm and also interpretability. Why interpretability is important? Because if you are not able to interpret your algorithm, you are probably not able to make a recommendation. So if you look to simple algorithms like regre linear regression, sorry, they are really easy to model. They are working pretty good, depending on your use case. And they are really easy to interpret. Because it's really, so you can make recommendations based on linear regression because it's easy to, to understand why the linear regression is making that prediction. On the other side, you need to, you need to know pretty well the data. That works pretty well for, I want to buy a new apartment, and I want to, can you predict uh, what is the price of those apartments in that neighborhood, you know, with different data around? Um, but if you don't know the data, it's on, I think it's almost impossible to make it work in a generic way for any process-based application. On the other side of the story, neural networks. Fantastic in terms of accuracy, uh, of course, algorithms based on observation. Uh, you can train them. Uh, what are the, the issues there? It's a black box. When you have a prediction on a, a neural network algorithm, it's, it's almost impossible to know what you're going to recommend, because you, you, you don't know exactly what was the sequence to come to this uh, prediction, or at least it's really hard. So uh, what we did, and I know that I'm taking some serious risk here, because I have the best process mining researchers in the world here in the table, I'm going I'm gonna, to I'm gonna talk about process mining, but uh, I'm going to take the risk. Uh, we discover a facet of process mining that we didn't know. Honestly, until last year, for me, process mining was about process discovery. Um, you know, you don't, you don't have a model, and you discover a model. So it was like, that not relates to what I'm doing, because I already have a model. For me, process mining was, OK, let's check conformity. Let's see if there is a deviation between the execution and your process model. Uh, and then I discovered something that I think the uh, it's called process mining extension, or extended process mining. I don't know who we call it. Which is like, you have a model, and you are more interested on knowing how you can predict uh, um, and, and make it more efficient. So that's what we did. Uh, so I'm quoting here, of course, um, the, the team of Dr. Van der Waals uh, in Eindhoven, because that was probably the first paper, well, the first paper I found. I think it was started earlier, but it was in 2004. So we actually implemented that. Something a little bit uh, we adding our own source, but we implemented that. So basically, is we take all the process execution log. We of course transform that into transition system. So for every step in the process, you know when the step starts and when the step ends. You annotate it with uh, different information. For example, time-related information. Then you can calculate and uh, apply different functions there. So you can have you, ha you can have average, uh, and this is exactly the implementation that we did. And uh, before going a little bit more details, this is kind of application that you can have for implementing, on top of a BPM platform, an algorithm that process mining extension. So uh, this, this example application is a loan, ap loan request application based on loan request process. You put that into the hands of a guy in a bank that is managing how people in his team are process is processing ro loads. And the majority of the banks has an SLA of, let's say, 48 hours or 72 hours to process a loan. So the, the goal is clear. 
So the, the efficiency in a process like that or in an application like that is, are we respecting the SLA, yes or no? So an algorithm like that, it's a perfect example, no? So uh, can we predict when an SLA is fulfilled or not? Can we prevent that something is not gonna, is gonna be late? Can we recommend corrective action? That's what we did, for example, with this application. So you can see how many loans are late, actually, how many loans are green, and how many, how many loans are predicted late. And for the ones predicted late, you can have some information because you have all this information about why, what was the average, uh, and what are the actions that you can do. For example, what we are you can Im implement it here is like you can switch with your finger and say like, assign this task to somebody else based on a recommendation. So how that can be easily implemented, I try to put it here in a generic way, how you can easily implement it on top of an existing BPM solution. Left side could be your favorite BPM engine solution, actually. So you have an engine, you have a database for storing the data execution. You have your apps, process-based apps. You usually have REST APIs or Java APIs to interact with the engine. And on the right side, you can think about implementing process mining extension as a new module that is going to come and it's gonna, you can plug to an existing production uh, BPM server to leverage all the historical data. You don't need to wait. So you go there, you go to a customer that is already in production, you plug this new module, you start implementing some techniques like data pooling. So we did some kind of incremental data pooling techniques to bring the data that is useful that you want to use for the prediction model. You usually store that in another separate storage system. Could be big data system, could be in our case was Elasticsearch, uh, also to take benefit of the easy query. Then you can apply the model that we just saw. In that case, I call it a remaining time prediction model because again, uh, it needs to be adapted to your goal. And in that case, the goal is remaining time. You can apply other techniques like a fall for doing the training and, and the test set. Uh, and then you can expose all this data to different people. You can expose all this data to developers that they want to just reach information from the new storage, or they want to reach information from the predictions or recommendations. Or you can build the application that they just illustrated. The monitoring application for the operational manager is the one that I just illustrated before. So we, you can pre-build applications for your, your users or customers. And something that I didn't show because we don't have enough time today is like, you can also have, you, I mean, you need to have what they call a developer application in which basically a developer, not, not necessarily a data science guy, is gonna go there and say, okay, yeah, let's have a list of all the process-based applications that they have available. For example, loan process application. Let's select this one because I want to see if there is a candidate for prediction. Because maybe you don't have enough data. Maybe your prediction is not accurate enough. Let's, uh, let's do the, the pooling exercise to take all the information. Let's see uh, if there are some data sets that they want to exclude because I think that they are not relevant for the prediction. Let's do the training, let's get the accuracy, and only after that, let's publish. You can do that for every single process, for every single process-based application. It's really powerful. So just one example of how you, know, you, can, you can easily do it. Uh, what are the advantage? You don't need to know the data. I'm not saying the data is not important. You will see that in a minute, but you don't need to know the data. It can be generic, because you already have all the information. You are based on the process model itself. It's easy to understand and interpret. Actually, if you can predict, I think I remember in a video <laughs> which you were saying, if you can predict, you can recommend. So that's exactly, that's exactly the point. With this kind of algorithm, if you are able to predict, you are able to recommend. And, uh, and, the, and the great thing is like, you are able to recommend by using the prediction algorithm and doing a simulation on it, because you know exactly what's going, what can happen afterwards. Uh, and of course, can be extended to different other use cases. So different use cases that can be extended is, of course, integrate contextual information or business data information. If you already have, uh, uh, going back to the loan application, if you already have a business uh, loan data available, maybe you want to create also some correlations there, no? And then you can start uh, enriching your model with business data. You can work on better team, effici team efficiency management, because the majority of the inefficiencies are related to people involved in the project, in the process. You can also extend that to what is the probability to fail in terms of, I'm, I'm talking about technical failures. Usually a connector is the cause of uh, a failure. By not, you have this information, you can extend the model to have information about the connectors that are running. And the really interesting part for us is that we are currently now focusing on, can we extend uh, 
that to user interfaces. Again, uh, for me, a process-based application is a process-based application that is delivering a good user experience to users. User interface connected to process. Here, we're still solving the process side of the story. Can we go up? What is the scenario? Sometimes, a manual step in the process uh, is the one that's taking too long. You can predict it. You can predict that you're going to be late. But you cannot maybe recommend, with only this information, you cannot maybe recommend an action. For example, uh, if it's a step in the process in which it's not an agent of the bank taking the action, but it's the end user, it's not a problem of, you cannot reroute the information to another user. So you need to deal with that, no? Um, so uh, there are sit in those situations, having some kind of user interface analysis and enriching your model could be really handy. Uh, there are some tools that allows to do that without the artificial intelligence angle. So this is a tool that allows you to do that, only pure user experience analysis, so without intelligence. But just to give you an example, this, by the way, is a tool called Six, uh, Six Insights from BP3. On the bottom of the screen, you see a process. In that example, is a car purchase process. In the second step of the process, which is called perform research, you have two forms, two user interactions. The first form is, is called primary research screen. And the, and the form is the one that you saw on the, on the top of the screen. So with those kind of tools that basically are using also can, uh, uh, kind of big data technology to, to process all the data, Again, it's not artificial intelligence, it's just, it's just pure user analysis. Uh, you can get a, a feeling of, from all the interactions from the users with the screen, you can have a heat map and say like, okay, this section in red is the one in which people are spending more time. And you can even find that something weird is happening in the driver details uh, dialog window. Why? Because maybe peop some people, some demographic people uh, in uh, Europe are having issues to enter the driver license because the guy that has designed the UI was from the US and he was expecting a US format. And so, uh, of course, you, ca you can get all of that doing analysis. But can we enrich the current model with all this data? Because at the end, the user interface is connected to the process to also enrich your prediction and, rec and making the right recommendations. No? Um, so, for example, you should redesign <laughs> or add a lead, at least a validator or, or an error that is more explicit. So that's one thing. Can we enrich the existing model with this kind of information? At, at the end, the user interface is related with the, with the process. And uh, so this is uh, what I call intelligent continuous improvement. And again, of user interfaces in connection with the process, not only to the process base. Second thing that we are also exploring is the concept of page flow. Because in this example, you have one step with one form interacting with one step, representing one step in the process, but there are some user interfaces that are quite complex, and you have 10 forms interacting at the end. The last one is gonna launch a process or is gonna make a process progress. So, uh, but at the end, a page flow looks like a process. You have different steps. Those steps are, are forms that are connecting, depending on what you are gonna fulfill. It's not transactional, but it's kind of a, a process. Can we also extend uh, the current algorithm to think uh, of a page flow like a, a part of your process. Those are the two things that we're currently uh, looking at. So by the way, I'll be happy uh, to, to, um, to discuss with, with you uh, about, uh, you know, if they, some of you are, are doing any research of uh, how artificial intelligence relates to uh, user interfaces in BPM, because this is exactly what we are currently doing. Uh, so I think I'm almost on time. So uh, I'm gonna just do some kind of closing thoughts, uh, which is actually, kind of a wrap up of what they just said. So probably you got from this presentation that I'm really interested on a BPM platforms working with innovative teams, innovative projects that helps people to get better user experience. Again, sometimes that sounds obvious, but on a day-to-day -day basis, we forget about that sometimes. So let's make it happen. And it's a mix of mindset and technology that we saw. Again, I think that we have a real chance because the process-based apps by nature are about perfect interaction between UI, processes, and business data. Let's make it happen. We're in a better position than anybody else to make it happen. And last but not least, I love human, humans, so I prefer to use IE to empower humans to make the right decisions. And uh, one of the top decisions that you need to do 
uh, when you're building applications, like how I'm detecting inefficiencies, can I, uh, can I improve uh, the way we are developing and improving applications? And I end up with a quote. Actually, the VPM word was not part of the quote initially, because that's a US uh, famous rapper and singer. But I thought that adding VPM fit really well there. You know, it's probably me that I'm really obsessed about VPM. But um, you know, we are seeing more and more use cases in which VPM technology could be the right fit. So uh, of course, a VPM platform, a VPM technology is not going to solve all the problems, but it's usually a damn good place to, to start. Thank you very much. I don't know if we have some time for questions or. Yeah, we do. We, we have some time for questions from the audience. Yeah, first of all, thank you for this very nice talk. Uh, I think it's a very good overview on all the uses of, of, of VPN. My main question is uh, what do you think for the future? Is the VPN, uh, the VF, for instance, a kind of supporting role for the digital transformation or a leading role? <laughs> That's a good question. The question was like, do you think that um, VPM is going to have a supporting role or a leading role on digital transformation? Um, I would say a, a leading role is probably the answer that, uh, that, that everybody here will say. But you know, the good thing is like, you know, as part of my job, I'm discussing also on a weekly basis with the analyst. And you know, the Gartner, Forrester, those guys are in, has a big influence on the market. And the good thing is like all those guys and also the other vendors are moving on that direction. So meaning that I think that the, um, I think it's not a surprise, but uh, in the next year, the name of the BPM research for both Forrester and Garner is gonna probably change to something close to digital transformation. So it's happening. So uh, all the essence is there. The customers are start asking for that. When, you, when people talk about what is a digital platform and you see all the topics that compose a digital platform, you have a lot of components that are on a, from a VPN platform. People talk about uh, ability to uh, manage processes. People talk about uh, connectivity. People talk about uh, human interactions, cognitive. So if we do a good, wall, a, a good work there, I think all the ingredients are there. And even the analysts are pushing on that direction. So I think that's promising, at least. So in the last couple of months, I learned a couple of examples, and uh, they actually make me think uh, we have pretty serious challenge in BPM and uh, improvement and AI. Let me mention these examples. Mm -hmm. Example one, uh, mm -hmm. a large corporation is trying to learn about in hiring uh, employees, new yep. employees, trying to learn about what makes a good, successful employee. So they look at all the personnel files, do the, all the analysis, and uh, find the conclusions but then at decision time, they have serious doubts. The reason is the successful employees they found were typical white male. And uh, now the atmosphere is different, the environment is different, and it's really difficult to take the old data about old employees and apply to new ones. Mm -hmm. Second example, uh, in one of the largest hospitals in China, uh, they actually analyzed the uh, uh, patients for you know, suffering from thyroid cancer, mm -hmm. and uh, they actually look at a lot of data, do the analysis, and try to use data analysis to replace an intrusive procedure yep. uh, for detection to yep. make a decision whether the patient has thyroid cancer or not. And very similar, they, the, the research is great, they get very accurate, very nice algorithm. However, at the same time, they are thinking, well, the thyroid cancer depends uh, in some large factor on the dietary habits. Mm -hmm. And uh, the dietary habits have been changed. So they, it puts a question to the hospital management, say whether they want to replace that procedure or not. Yeah. So my question is, how can we deal with these uh, history buyers? I think it's very too critical, especially for BPM. Yeah, that's a good question. And, and you know, I, I the, the reality is that the, the issue with uh, artificial intelligence, not only on BPM, is that as soon as you have your data model that is changing, or your data that is changing, then it, I mean, it's hard to manage, no? It's not only the two examples can apply to BPM, but can apply to other, other ways to use artificial intelligence. That basically the, also the issues that uh, people like IBM are having with uh, Watson for, for, the, for in the medical care. Um, so my answer will be like, you know, we need to start, you need to solve every, pro every single problem at a time. So we need to start, there is a ton of use cases in which uh, 
you know, the model is not going to change, or the data that you have already is representative, and you're going to be able to make right predictions. And then, of course, we need to, we need to work on what happened when the data changed or when the model changed, because it's the same thing, no? You have all that working on the version one of your loan application, and you add three new steps in between. What happened with all the historical data? In this case, maybe easy to fix because it's just adding activities, but it can be get, uh, get more complicated. So uh, I don't have a perfect answer, but it's just like we need to move step by step, and there is a ton of situations in which uh, things are not changing that much. Or maybe a second part of my, my answer will be, this is why I'm not a big believer of artificial intelligence doing everything uh, uh, without a human, is that at some point, uh, you're going to be pretty uh, uh, comfortable about saying, like, this is my prediction, and you know, uh, I'm, I think that I'm really great there, and you should follow that. And another situation in which you say, maybe not, or this is just a suggestion, you have other options, and maybe the doctor in that case, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that robots are going to replace doctors in all situations. It's going to help a lot, but at some point, for some tricky uh, scenarios, uh, or when there is some feelings involved, maybe there is some feeling, there is people that they should be treated that way, and the guy don't want to be treated that way. So uh, the, the doctor is going to... Uh, you know, use it as a additional information. So that's, those will be my two answers. Like, let's start applying it to the things that we know that uh, are going to work uh, uh, with a high accurate rate. And secondly, let's use it just as another tool for making the right decisions. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so, so thanks for the very nice talk. Uh, so when we talk about BPM, we talk about the spectrum, right? Yeah. The spectrum is from very structured to very unstructured yeah. processes. You mentioned robotic process automation, which I think 25 years ago we called straight through processing. Exactly. Uh, so it's very process model centric, uh, etc. Yeah. What I and on the other end, you have very unstructured processes. So in your talk, you did not use the word flexibility. Yeah suggesting that flexibility is not important anymore. <laughs> At the same time, you didn't show a single process model. So could you elaborate a bit on your views on uh, are there still process models in Bonita Soft? Sure. And how do you deal with flexibility? And I was partly triggered by your comment, we do not need to do discovery because we already know the process model. And I think if you have flexibility, mm. you do not know the process. Sure. You know, that's a, that's a good point. You know, it's like a, I had a ton of topics to cover, so it's you know at some point you need to make the focus. So, uh, you know, I didn't I didn't mention you know uh, flexibility or ad hoc processes or you know case management or things that are adding flexibility, because for the purpose of the what I wanted to illustrate, I want to put the focus on uh, user experience uh, and uh, then uh, on uh, the predictive model based on really structured process. Because the reality is that this model works pretty well when everything is really structured. So th that, that's our focus. Then, uh, and I didn't want to talk uh, as well. I'm not here to sell my, my, my company product. Uh, but of course, we, we support uh, uh, kind, of, kind of flexibility and ad hoc processes. Uh, all the, um, uh, we, we didn't apply yet this flexibility to the prediction algorithm because we are you know, learning also uh, you know, as, as we progress. So for the moment, so we have flexibility. We have different capabilities to add this flexibility. Um, but we don't apply yet uh, prediction to that. That's a kind of a short, I, I mean, we can discuss about that. but Because uh, I think it's very interesting if you provide flexibility to analyze how users use this flexibility. I think there's lots of value, value in that. That makes sense. Uh, thank you, Miguel. It was refreshing to see, at least at the end, <laughs> that your company is investing in predictive process monitoring. Mm -hmm. uh, in this community, we are doing a lot of research in that area, so it's good that there is a, a strong alignment. So yesterday, we were talking with one of your competitors uh, about predictive process monitoring, and he was saying, uh, you know, the market is very tough in that area because um, for process automation, modeling, and the like, we had to convince process owners and analysts but now there are a couple more roles in the loop yeah. if we want to convince them to use predictive process monitoring. Yeah. Talking about operational managers and process participants. That's what I talk, operational so manager. what is your take on that? Is the market ready to take up uh, predictive process monitoring? Especially yeah. because you alluded to the importance of explainability, but we are not quite there. We are not yet able to fully explain these yeah. predictions and ends to give trustworthy mm -hmm. recommendations. You know, that's, a, that's a good question. You know, yeah, there is a, that's one of the good and the bad things about BPM, is that uh, 
potentially, not only the predictive side of the story, but BPM by itself, it's uh, impacting potentially a ton of different profiles, from business people to really developers, no? So um, it's hard because, and, and as, a, as a provider of technology, it's really hard because you are selling to different profiles and you know that different profiles are gonna be using your software. And you know that the majority of the projects in general that are not successful is when you have more profiles working together, by definition. No? This is why some markets are tougher than others, because when you are only focusing one profile, it's way easier. Um, so uh, yeah, it's tough, and I don't have all the, you know, the answers there. Our, something that I didn't say here, uh, and it's probably part of our open source DNA, is that we are primarily working with developers. So of course, we are selling to business people, um, but the business people can be a VP of engineering. But the majority of the guys that uh, are using our software and the guys, I mean, I'm not saying that we don't have tools for business people, but we're putting the effort on developers. So if you need to make a choice, that's something that I learned in the US, you need to be good at something. So we're focusing on technical people. Um, and it's, uh, with this new module, it's the first time that we are saying, okay, we're gonna go to see the operational manager, and the operational manager is probably the buyer, and the guy is gonna use it. So that's kind of, we're extending. And, 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 and it's a different category of And people, it's a different category. Different and, mindset. And this module is gonna be available in over year, so we don't have experience yet selling it. But, uh, but that's the, kind of the first time in which uh, also we are massively interacting with another uh, uh, kind of user. No? Again, I'm not saying that we don't work with, the, with, with business users, but uh, with primarily talking with developers. Technical people, actually. I mean, technical people in the whole organization, VP organization, no? IT organization. So we'll see with, for the new one. It's not gonna be easy, that's for sure. But I think you need to be focused. If you, if you need to start, if you do these kind of things, we selected the operational managers because that makes sense. And those are the, the first ones that has a need for improvement. So we're gonna be focusing on that and then we're gonna be focusing on technical people that also wants to improve and th that they are the guys that are building the application and doing continuous delivery. So those are, those are, are gonna be our first targets. Make sense? really pragmatic approach. Okay, uh, uh, we're out of time now, so that brings us to the end of the session. I'd like to thank the speaker once again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you. Another story. Oh, good for you. thank you very much. Organizers. Thank you. Uh, that's the end of the session. Thank you all for coming. We have a coffee break now.